Hey, thanks for joining us again at Johnson Corners Wesleyan Church's online church service for August 9th, 2020. You know, we've been uh, <clears throat> talking about a few different things in faith and, and, and different aspects. And today I want to take a little bit of direction on, on, on really engaging in the idea of running the race that God has laid out for us. So let's get started with the prayer and then we'll jump right in. Father God, we are just so thankful, Lord. Thankful for the opportunity to just rest in you, to come together with um, just with each other wherever we're at, Lord, whether we're sitting in our living rooms, whether we're uh, with a group of people out and about somewhere, whether or not we're just driving somewhere watching this, Lord, we would just ask that um, our invitation for you to be with us would be one that would just open our hearts to hear your word today, Lord, and help us in that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, just the other day I was thinking about how I, how I miss the Olympics with all the COVID stuff and, and so many things shut down um, being 2020. And like, I, I just miss the Olympics. I miss the Olympics so much. And, and I love the different ways that uh, people would compete in the different events, watching the competitors uh, and cheering on for the U.S. team to win in each of their events and um, just really watching some of those events when they come down to the wire to watch people dig deep, dig down really deep to, to accomplish the goals that they had set, to overcome and per, persevere against the people next to them to win and take home that gold. And so I was reading in scripture and I found myself in a place um, in Hebrews and I just want to talk about this idea of Olympics and the rest. I want you to think about yourself in the Olympics. Think about that. Let's say a group of people show up, uh, the U.S. Committee for the Olympics, and they show up and they invite you to be a part of the Olympics. Think about just a knock on the door and they show up and they say, we want you to represent our country in the Olympics and of all things, a marathon. Now, for some of you, I think that would be exciting for people who are like me. There's no excitement in that at all. As a matter of fact, it would be scary for them to say, you know what, we want you to be our marathon runner. We want you to be a part of our team. We want you to run this race for us and represent our country. Now, you, you could be surprised, especially if you're like me, because the furthest that you've probably ran in years is from the couch to the refrigerator. As a matter of fact, anytime you try to start some running or or uh, regiment in your life. You know, you probably find yourself running down the driveway, getting to the sidewalk and then being exhausted and you can barely run yourself back to the lazy boy. You know, you, I know that it just doesn't sound appealing at all to someone like me in my position. But what if, what if you get over that shock of it and you really say to yourself, I can do this. What if, what if you get that emotion growing inside of you, that excitement to want to be a part of it and not just a part of it, but want to train to get to do what you might have been born to do? What if you were literally born to do that? You know, the race becomes a great passion to someone in their life then when they feel like this is something I need to do. And I love that aspect because what if we ran the race of life like that, like a, like a marathon runner would run their race, but for Christ and Christ in our life, that long endurance of the rest of our life being who God created us to be. It would be the idea of focusing on the idea of living a marathon life in Christ. Let's look at what that would take. For each and every one of us. For that, we would have to look at the, the characteristics of a particular race, a marathon race. You know, as a believer in Christ, you run a race. You already run a race every single day of your life. It too is a race of a lifetime. It too dominates your mind. It too occupies your waking moments. It too becomes a central focus of your existence. It too is what you live for. Matter of fact, Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore, since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that lies before us. You know, we have to realize that in this race, like the Olympic race, you have been chosen. The time, however, is not 
the Olympic Committee showing up and knocking on your door and saying, we have selected you. God himself has selected you to be a part of this race. He's picked you. He has chosen you to run this race for the rest of your life. Imagine the thrill of them showing up from the Olympics and saying, we have chosen you. Just like imagining how God has knocked on the door of your heart saying, I have chosen you. For a marathon racer wanting to achieve the gold medal, it would be one of the greatest opportunities in their life. Why as Christians do we not see that we are in this race for the Lord as, as anything short of one of the greatest opportunities of our life? We should look at our life as one of the greatest opportunities to do good for the Lord, to make something of ourselves. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, then God has done just that. He's given you the opportunity to run this race that we call life. This race is both a contest and a conflict. And what I mean by that in, it's not any ordinary race that we've ran in our life or anything else that we see when we watch TV or the Olympics or the rest. As a matter of fact, the Greek word for race comes from agon, which is where we in the English language get the word agony. So the race is a contest of really daily progress in our personal life toward accomplishing to be more like Jesus every single day. In many ways, the race itself <clears throat> isn't even against opponents, but against ourselves. Are you more like Jesus today than you were yesterday? If you can say yes to that, then you are making the progress in this race that you have as life. If it's no, then you need to decide, are you going to run this race to win? The race is also a conflict. And when I talk about a conflict, it's more of that internal struggle of our soul. Because scripture tells us that we are naturally inclined, which is bent towards sin and laziness. And so we have to engage in the necessary disciplines and activities of life that would enable us to grow and mature to be more like Christ in our life. You know, we have to realize that this race is a unique race for each and every one of us. It's not the same from one to the other, that this specific race is individualized to each person running in it. Like the little orange cones that tell people where to go, each of us have our own set of cones that we have to follow, even though the destination is the same, which is to live a Christ-filled, reflecting life. The journey is not the same. So we can't compare our track that we're running on with anybody else's track out there. As a matter of fact, the race has no timeouts, has no limits, has no breaks. When we look at a marathon race, it's exactly the same. They, they don't get to call timeout, they don't get to take breaks. There's no halftime, there's no intermission. It's from start to finish and they're instructed to keep on running. And that's the way it is for us with the Lord. In our life, we need to keep on running. You know, the race is also full of obstacles. You know, you look at a marathon and they just keep pace from start to finish. They try to do it as quick and consistently as humanly possible to get to the end. Unlike the marathon, our race in life with Christ is more like a warrior dash or more like a tough mutter where we, we know our races are full of things like obstacles and barriers, hurdles and hazards, you know, and they can't be avoided and they can't just be erased. And a lot of those things come in different sizes. One day we might have a little problem, the next day we'll have one of the biggest problems that we may ever face in our life. And the other thing is, is they come in different stages of our life. And we have to realize that about the race that we're running. As a matter of fact, when we run this weight race, regardless of those obstacles, we have to have the right mindset and the right mindset is to win the race. And what I mean by this, 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, run in such a way that you may win. So winning is not beating the other runners. The prize that it's talking about here is becoming a spiritual champion. What I mean by that is that's someone who's sold out for Jesus. That's someone who's strain, straining in their life to become more like him every single day. The finish line of faith is a life that is more Christian today than it was yesterday. It's that continued progress of moving forward in life. The goal is not perfection. The goal is progression, that we would continue to grow more and more like him every single day. But winning the race 
it requires something for us. It requires an endurance in our life. And endurance is important because winning the race will, will require great endurance, perseverance, patience, and resolve. Those are all things that we need to learn to develop as a skill in our life to be able to push through all those obstacles, those barriers, those hurdles, those hazards, those things that keep us from moving forward in the Lord. Because victory requires that we run with undeniably persistent, un, uh, uh, steadfast endurance until we arrive at the finish. And that finish would be our victory. But we have to understand that when we run this race, there's a principle to the race. And what I mean by that is let's look back to if you were being invited to run uh, for the U.S. again for the Olympics. Reality would set in and maybe you realize that you can't do it even if you tried. But if you are serious about seizing the gold and, and standing at the winner's platform, that you know you are going to have to enter into a lifetime of training. What I mean by that is if you're in a position right now where you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you haven't decided to run the race, then you need to, to work up to where you need to be so that you are engaged in the race, that you are moving forward, that you are developing those skills of that persistence and that uh, perseverance and that endurance and that overcoming this. And, what, and that takes time to move forward. Like, not all of us are in a place where we're like at the top of our game running marathons. You know, when you think about marathon runners, you know, they, they all have these little, these little stickers on the back of their car. Look at that, 26.2 miles. You know, it's a little sticker about this big in the little car telling everybody, look at me, I ran a, I ran a marathon, you know. And then, then you got all those others that are, you know, I'm a half marathon. I'm working on a 13.1, you know, that little one there. You know, to be perfectly honest at this stage of life I'm in, you know, a 5K would probably come close to killing me because I'm just not engaged in that race. As a matter of fact, because of my build and the rest, I'm a 90 foot guy. I'm a baseball player. Matter of fact, I'm going to take that and put it all the way across the back window of my car because you know what? That's my race right there. 90 feet. Now think about what that means. We all have this race. The race isn't the same from one person to another, but the goal in the end is what we're after. And what is that? To finish the race, to win the race, to become that spiritual champion. And so we can't compare our track with anyone else's. And so as part of the principle of the race, we have to realize that we need to rearrange our life around certain practices that would really enable us to do what we can't do on our own power. And what I mean by that is when we realize how many hours an Olympic athlete actually puts into training. The average Olympian trains four hours a day, 310 days a year, six years before succeeding to that event. That's more than 7,000 hours for an event that could possibly last less than 60 seconds. Now, this need for training is not just for athletes alone. This is for anybody who plays musical instrument, anyone learning a new language, anyone acquiring a new skill in life. In fact, it is mandatory for any significant change in a person's life. Let me say that again. That kind of engagement in training is required for anyone making a significant change in their life because that is what's required for us on our end in effort, in endurance, in perseverance, in persistency to achieve that spiritual champion that God wants us to be. The single most important principle of running the race is not necessarily anything beyond running it so hard or training so hard. It's about training wiser. It's about being wise in what the Lord would ask us to do and what he would ask us to be. As a matter of fact, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 7, train yourself in godliness. This thought lies behind Paul's advice to the church in Corinth as well. In 1 Corinthians 9, 25, it says, Now everyone who competes exercise self-control in everything. However, they do it to receive a perishable crown, but we an imperishable crown. 
You know, when it comes to running marathons or becoming a spiritual champion, the need is not to try harder, but to train wiser. And we need to be wiser in how we train. How many times have you heard a sermon, listened to a Bible study, read a book about how to follow Jesus, and you said to yourself, man, I need to try harder to be a better Christian. That's like saying, I'm going to really try to compete in a triathlon. It won't happen by any act of my own personal will, by just saying I'm gonna do it and then just going and trying to run a, a triathlon. I would only be able to compete in a triathlon by training for a triathlon. And so if we take that same concept in our life, to live a life that Jesus taught and modeled, we need to train ourselves to do what Jesus taught and what he modeled. The activities that he did were prayer, Bible study, worship, service, evangelism, stewardship. These are all disciplines of running the spiritual race that God wants us to run in our life. As a matter of fact, let's look at the idea of the first one, prayer. Okay, How often are you talking with the Father each day? Look at your prayer life. Are you praying every single day? Now look at your prayers. Are your prayers about, Lord, can you fix it? Lord, can you help me? Lord, can you take care of this? Lord, will you do this for me? Or is there a little bit more about, Lord, I wish that you could care for this person. Lord, I wish this person uh, would know you. Lord, I pray that this person would be helped. There, there should be a healthy balance. And if, if yours are all one-sided one way or another, then you should be in God's word looking at the fact that how he modeled prayer to his disciples. And that is how we should model our prayer when we're teaching others to pray and when we're praying ourselves. How about the idea of a Bible study? Are you actively in a Bible study? Because I tell you what, are you engaged in a regular time of Bible reading, devotions, and study? That's an and. That's all three. That's not just one of them. We all should be reading our Bible every single day. We all should be engaging in devotions along the way. And there should be stories or studies or scriptures in the Bible that we are currently studying to find out more about them for our personal growth. And if you're not, then that's a, an activity of training that you can engage in at a higher level. How's your worship? When you show up, how, how often are you praising the Father in worship? And you can do this in a lot of different ways. You can do it through musical worship. You can do it through listening to uh, sermons and the rest. When we owned a lawn care business, I would listen to about three years worth of uh, some of my favorite pastors on, on podcasts while I was on a mower. And, and I tell you what, that gave me the opportunity to worship while I worked. And there's all kinds of different ways that we can worship throughout our everyday life that help train us on this run that we are racing in. You know, how about your service? Are you using the gifts that God has given you to serve his people? Are you helping the people around you? Are you helping the people of your community? You know, I, we, have, we have a lady in our congregation and she has a friend who, whose home just burnt down. So you know what? She's been networking to help find needs. She's been able to, to raise money. She's been able to get gift cards for them. She's been able to find people to fix things so that they can live in a camper while they figure out what to do with their home that they bought. She has done such a great job of surrounding them with an act and a heart of service. How about evangelism? Have you spoken to someone recently regarding their relationship with God? Do you not do that because you don't feel comfortable, you don't feel qualified, or are you just not doing it all because it's not on your radar? See, those are the things that we need to provide in our life as our activities and growing in our disciplines to do what God modeled. Last one is stewardship. Are you investing regularly and consistently in God's church with your time, your talents, and your financial resources? See, the secret to winning this race is truly to live a Christian-like life and is order our lives around these activities, these disciplines, or these practices because that's what Christ modeled to us. So if we want to truly be in this race and be more Christ-like, regardless of where we are in life, regardless of how we were brought up, regardless of how we were, we were shown, 
If we want to become life change, we have to put in the training. And the training is arranging our life around these disciplines and these practices so that we can become more like Christ every single day. So in order to accomplish this training, we can't do it by trying. We have to do it by allowing the Lord into our life with these things and surrounding it in the trainings that He provided for us. We also have to come to the realization that we need this race. What I mean by that is return, come back to the idea of you running the marathon in the next Olympics, okay? You begin working out, you quickly understand the need for intentional training, specific training in certain areas. And then the committee comes and they enlist you, not in a sprint, which would be short distance, but in a 26.2 mile endurance competition. Endurance being the key. That marathon is all about endurance, okay? When you're doing the short speed stuff, speed is the importance. When you're doing the dashes, it's all about the speed. But when it comes time to run that long race, that lifetime, you have to pace yourself and you have to have endurance. So as you leave the start line and you pace yourself, I've been told in a marathon there are two critical places that you have to overcome. Two critical places in the race that are extremely hard for people to overcome. The first is right out of the gate, because when you come right out of the gate, you're tempted to run too fast too soon. Your energy expends too soon, and then you have nothing left to actually end on the race. The second critical time in a marathon is at the halfway point. You suddenly come to the realization that you've gone this far, but you have just as much still to go. It's called hitting the wall. When they hit the wall, they start to run out of stamina and they're not sure that they can continue to put one foot in front of another for the rest of the race. So the races are not always won by the fastest, but rather by the one that keeps hanging on. The one who refuses to give up, the one who is the most persistent. There's a, there's a poem written by uh, D.H. Groberg and it's called The Race. And I'm just going to share a little stanza of it. And it's about a, uh, a father's son who, who's running in this race. And this is what he says. And to his dad, he sadly said, I didn't do it too well. To me, you won, his father said. You rose each time you fell. See, likewise in our race in life, we have to keep rising up. We have to continue to get back in. We have to continue to keep on. The spiritual race requires persistency in our life. Time and time again, the scripture is telling us that, that persistence and endurance is required. So the apostle Paul played, uh, prayed for the Colossians for this actually in 2 Timothy um, 2.12. He says, if we endure, we also reign with him. We also read in Hebrew 10.36, it says, For you need endurance so that after you have done God's will, you may receive what was promised. In the spiritual race you are running, don't quit. Never give up. Keep going. If you trip and fall, don't stay there. Continue to get back up. If life keeps throwing you curveballs in this race, maybe... Maybe you've been knocked off your feet a few times. Maybe you're thinking, since I'm already on the ground, I'm just going to stay here. Maybe I'm going to totally hang it up. And I'm telling you, don't do that. Let God work in your life. You know, back in 1924 Olympics, there was a gentleman by the name of uh, Eric Liddell. And Eric Liddell actually has a movie uh, after him called Chariots of Fire, if you've ever seen it. And he later in life became uh, a missionary. And in this time in the 1924 Olympics, he ran in the 100, the 220, and the 440. Now, the 440 is a quarter mile. That's one full circle. And for, for racers today, that's, they can sprint a straight quarter mile all the way around just, just because they have trained for that event, even though in my world, that's like a long ways. But in this 440, he took off with a group of others in the 1924 Olympics. And they, they grouped up really quick and there were some pushing and shoving and different things. And Liddell actually found himself tied up in a guy from England's feet called J.J. Gillies. And he tripped and fell. 
And while he was down there, he was slightly d dazed. And one of the officials screamed at him, get up and run. So he shook it off, he got up and ran. And while he got up and ran, they were 20 yards ahead of him. In a quarter mile, that is not very far to the finish line to make up 20 yards. But Eric Liddell found himself pushing, getting to fourth place, third place, second place. And he gets right up there and coming across the finish line, he broke ahead of J.J. Gillies and literally pushed his chest out to cross the finish line for first place. He collapsed and actually had to have medical people help take him off of the track. An article later, the next day came out in the Scotsman's newspaper, and it said the circumstances in which Liddell won the race made it a performance bordering on the miraculous. You know what? Our lives can have miraculous things happen in them because the Lord can use us to glorify him. Our, we can become the hands and feet of Jesus. We can become the doers of what God wants. And because of that, we can have the opportunity to have miraculous things happen in our life, just like Eric Liddell. As a matter of fact, when you talk to, to veteran runners, they will still refer back to Eric Liddell's race as one of the greatest track performances that anyone has ever seen in their life. And he will go down in history because he was willing to not quit. There's something noble and honorable about not quitting, about getting back up and dusting yourself off and continuing to compete in everyday life. Remember, it's not about finishing last or finishing first, but it's about just finishing. Don't give up on God because God hasn't given up on you. You can do this. You can finish the race. You can bring home the gold. And it's all whether or not you choose to engage in this race that we call life. This race that we are running to become more Christ-like every single day. Think about where your current position is right now. Will you engage in the training so that you will have the endurance to run the race? Will you get off the sofa and get in the race? Will you get out of the pews and get in the race? Will you decide that enough's enough, I'm going to arrange my life around the activities that Jesus modeled? Prayer, study, worship, service, evangelism, stewardship. Will I, will I make those godly things a part of my everyday life? And I hope you do. So I want to leave, leave you with one last scripture here today. In 1 Peter 1.13, it says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Father God, we are just so thankful, Lord. We're thankful for the opportunities for you to help carry us, to stand beside us, to not forsake us, to energize us, to be there when we don't have the willpower to overcome that you can push us through these times. Lord, let this race of life that we are running, Lord, glorify you. Let us make changes in our life to rearrange our life around the things that are important, the things that you modeled, the things that you did, the things that you talked about, the things you want us to be, the things you want us to do. Lord, help us to be more and more like you every single day on that continued progression. Let us continue to train so that we can continue to make a difference in planting those seeds, that you can mature those seeds when that time comes. Lord. Send us, use us, let us be your hands and feet. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks again for tuning in Johnson Corners Wesleyan Church's online weekend service for August 9th, 2020. Hope to see you next week. Have a great week.